Hello, good people of God. This is Pastor Phil from First Lutheran in Mission Hills, Kansas. I've decided to do a series on the book of Romans. We may not do every single Wednesday on, uh, on Romans. We may mix it up a bit, but I'd like to, uh, to start working through Romans, which is a fascinating book. It sort of represents the culmination of St. Paul's uh, theological development. It's sort of his magnus opus, so to speak. Um, his theology develops from uh, his first writings in like 1 Thessalonians, which is what we think is the earliest New Testament writing, uh, through Romans, uh, uh, which is a far more complex document. One of the ways we know uh, the timing on these writings is that uh, in 1 Thessalonians, St. Paul is expecting, along with the rest of the Christian church, the imminent return of Christ. Uh, they kind of thought Jesus was coming right back. Uh, after he ascended into heaven, or at least fairly soon. And of course, as time goes on, uh, the church has to begin to think about and wrestle with the fact that, that Jesus may, may have been thinking in the longer term than anyone has expected. And of course, we know that to be the truth now. So Romans begins uh, with an address. And one of the things that's interesting to study about and to read about is how uh, St. Paul's writings reflect... Um, uh, traditions of writing letters and traditions of giving speeches that were present in the Greek world. And uh, it's kind of funny, actually. One of the things that was uh, common then and common now is when you want to give somebody some bad news, you give them some good news first. So uh, you sort of uh, surround a criticism with praise and that people are more likely to, to accept it. And you can actually almost look at every one of Paul's letters and it's, it's in that form. So that's an, uh, a neat study to do if you want it. It begins with this uh, address from Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the service of the gospel that God promised long ago through his prophets and the Holy Scriptures. So, called to be an apostle. Apostle is a word that means one who is sent out. So, it's different than the term disciple, which sort of connotes the teaching, the, the receiving, the learning. Uh, from Jesus. So you're a disciple first, you receive the learning, and then you become an apostle, which is one who is sent out with a message, a messenger, a herald, uh, and then set apart for the service of the gospel. Set apart actually is, is the same exact uh, phrasing as the word sanctify. Sanctify means to set apart as holy. And so you would use the word sanctify for sacred vessels, for uh, so the vessels used for Holy Communion are sort of sanctified. The, the sanctuary we think of as a sanctified or holy place, something that's set aside for a holy use. So you're not going to take the chalice from the altar and go uh, you know, use it for a common purpose. It's set aside for that purpose. So Paul is saying that he is set aside for this holy purpose of being an apostle. And we can, you know, think of ourselves in that way. Not, not all of us are called to, you know, get on a boat and sail to a foreign country and start telling people about Jesus. Um, but we're all set apart for certain good works, and it's it's sort of an uplifting and very empowering uh, thought to think, you know, there are good works in place that are only for us to do, that only we can do because only we're in a position to do them. Um, uh, only we are in our time, our place, with our particular gifts, and so God has set us aside like a holy, like, you know, like a holy vessel to be uh, be God's agents in the world, and in, in only the way that we can be. Uh, Paul knows this, and he intends for us to know that as well. So set apart for the service of the gospel that God promised long ago through his prophets and the holy scriptures. This is the gospel concerning his son, who in terms of human nature was born a descendant of David, and who in terms of the spirit and of holiness was designated son of God in power by resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through whom we have obtained, uh, through whom we have re received grace and our apostolic mission of winning the obedience of faith among all the nations for the honor of His name. Now that's a long sentence, but um, uh, there when he starts talking about uh, uh, in terms of human nature being a descendant of David, but in terms of spirit and of holiness designated as the Son of God, that's referring to. Uh, you know, in a very old teaching that was explained by some of the later councils uh, of the church of what we call the two natures of Christ. So there were those who wondered, you know, this Jesus character, was he God, you know, just pretending to be a person? Was, was 
was the humanity of Jesus uh, an act, and he was really God walking around? Or there were others that said, you know, Jesus was completely a, a normal person, but was especially gifted by God to, to have a prophetic message. Well, the church wrestled back and forth about this. There were discussions. And finally, what it came down to was sort of the beautiful teaching that Jesus is both God and man at the same time. The two natures of Christ are both God and human. And, and it's only in understanding uh, Jesus in this way that we understand that our salvation is due to this sharing. God in Christ shares our human nature. Um, lived a completely human life and yet was God. You know, it's sort of a oxymoron. It's sort of something you can't quite get your head around, but that's exactly the point, that in this one person, Jesus, God and humankind are united, and that's why that salvation takes place through this person in his flesh. You know, this, the teachings go on and on about how uh, it, it's in Jesus that heaven and earth are united, and the bridge between us is, is, uh, is, is healed. So he talks about that, and he goes again to say our apostolic mission. We're going again to that idea of being sent out. So when you have faith in Jesus, in some way it's going to be evangelical, even though that term is used differently nowadays. It's going to be apostolic, sent out with a message to win this obedience through faith. He sort of makes a point to say faith among all the nations, and that's important for this letter, because the church in Rome would have been unique in that it would have been a... Um, uh, a convergence of both formerly Jewish and Gentile believers, because Rome was a cosmopolitan city. So the, the Christian church in Rome would have been full of all different kinds of people from all different kinds of backgrounds. And so even in this address, even in this opening address, Paul is saying, you know, you've been brought together from all these different places, from all nations. Some of you used to be faithful Jewish people. Some of you used to be pagans. But now we're all, uh, we're all together. And that will come back up uh, in the letter uh, again. Uh, you are among these, and by his call you belong to Jesus Christ, to all uh, God's beloved in Rome, called to be his holy people, grace and peace from God our Father uh, and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I give thanks to my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is talked about all over the world. Now, this goes back to what I was talking about, uh, the, the, the form of, preaching, of uh, uh, speaking and letter writing, where when you want to give somebody a correction, or you want to teach them something or ask them to change, uh, they're going to accept that better when you couch it in praise first. And so this is an example of that. Your faith is known all over the world. Um, God, whom I serve with my spirit in preaching the gospel of his Son, is my witness that I continually mention you in my prayers, asking always that by some means I may at long last be enabled to visit you, if it is God's will. For I am longing to see you so that I can convey to you some spiritual gift that will be a lasting strength, or rather that we may be strengthened together through our mutual faith, yours and mine. I want you to be quite certain, too, brothers, that I have often planned to visit you, though up to the present I have always been prevented, in the hope that I might work as fruitfully among you as I have among the Gentiles elsewhere. I have an obligation to Greeks as well as barbarians, to the educated as well as the ignorant, and hence the eagerness on my part to preach the gospel to you in Rome. Paul really has a sense that... Um, you know, other people may have been sent to, uh, you know, to, to uh, minister to the to the Jewish people in particular, but he sees himself as this person who's going to forget everything else in order to be uh, a preacher for every person. Um, he's going to set aside, uh, you know, things that might be important to him otherwise in order to only uh, present the gospel in its simpleness. For I see no reason, and we're going to close with this and start again next time, for I see no reason to be ashamed of the gospel. It is God's power for uh, the salvation of everyone who has faith, Jews first, but Greeks as well. For it is in, uh, for in it is revealed the saving justice of God, a justice based on faith and addressed to faith. As it says in Scripture, anyone who is upright through faith will live. So there again, um, emphasizing the uniting factor of the gospel, that it's for all people. But also this thing about not being ashamed of it. You know, Rome, Rome being a place where philosophy and all different kinds of religious traditions would have met. It's been written a lot that, you know, this, this idea of this Jewish carpenter being raised from the dead would have almost seemed, you know, sort of like a simple, um, uh, uh, you know, 
folk belief or you know not nearly as developed as some of the the, the very ornate ideas of philosophy that were present um, a superstition almost you know sort of this superstitious simple story that's come out of the backwoods up in Israel uh, rather than something to be taken seriously and so uh, Paul says I'm not ashamed of that uh, I'm not ashamed of what this story is because it's the power of salvation I know it to be and when you embrace it you'll know it to be too uh, there there are different ways of thinking but this story is the one that God has given uh, to man for them to know that they are saved uh, by by God's grace through Jesus Christ uh, so so uh, if you happen to be following along in your Bible and didn't see anything matching up, I'm using a translation called the New Jerusalem Bible, which I quite like. Um, it just words things just a little bit differently. It's actually got an interest in history if you want to look it up. It has to do with the French translation of the, ori of the original documents. But anyway, thank you for listening. Uh, I hope that you will uh, join us again as we move through the Book of Romans, and we'll be throwing in some other things also. God bless you.